me just pull my screen up here though. Well, I appreciate you guys for hopping on the Zoom call today. I think as you guys know, we were supposed to have this call last week, but out of respect for uh, Therese Paler and his legacy, we thought it'd be appropriate to um, postpone this call a week. Um, once again, on behalf of the organization, um, our, our deepest condolences go out to his family and, and his fiance, Ebony. Uh, I know Taylor would have loved being on this call today. This was his time of year, the draft and free agency and, and, and putting the, uh, the roster together. So um, certainly gonna miss him today. Um, look forward to talking to you guys about the future of the Chiefs. Um, before I do that, just real quickly on the 2020 season, you know, really proud of the organization from Clark down to Mark, uh, certainly Andy and his staff and our players. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, um, you know, the hurdles that we had to overcome just to get the season um, to the finish line. So everybody in our, you know, in our facility here, the operations people, the facilities people, and, and Rick and his amazing staff keeping our players healthy throughout the course of the season um, was, was certainly quite a feat. You know, I think after last season and winning the Super Bowl, if, if you would have said, you know, we would have went 14 and two, eight and one on the road, back to back Lamar Hunt trophies and back to back Super Bowl appearances, we had all been thrilled. But, you know, the reality of it is, um, you know, the expectations were high. So, you know, I'd be lying if I didn't say it was a disappointing ending. And, and certainly the way the game was played and the way we lost left a, left a sour taste in our mouth. But, um, you know, it's certainly motivating for us and for our staff here. And, you know, we're just anxious to get this uh, off season started and get right back at it. And hopefully we have um, fans back and, and things get back to normal uh, as soon as possible. So, again, look forward to the off season and, and improving this roster and hopefully putting our our organization uh, in a position to go back to the third, uh, a third straight Super Bowl, which would be quite a feat. So with that, I'll, I'll open it up and, and take your questions. Go first to Sam McDowell. Go ahead, Sam. Hey, Brett. Um, appreciate the words on Therese. Um, wanted to ask you about the offensive line. When you look at the makeup of your offensive line, do you feel like your solutions are in-house or do you feel like that's a position you're going to have to address outside of the facility? Yeah, I certainly think it'll be a combination of both. I mean, I mean, look, we, um, you, you know, Coach Heck and and our staff did an amazing job. I mean, we had uh, we had two opt outs with LDT and the Yang, and, and you know, we certainly missed those two players throughout the course of the season. Um, and we did a lot of shuffling, as you know, and and then certainly the final blow was losing Fisher in that Bills game, and you know that that was a daunting task to go up that go against that front in the Super Bowl. So, you know, we do like some of the young players and their progress and their development. Um, you know, Andrew Wiley has shown that he can play on a consistent level and at that guard position and Allegretti took a step forward. We're anxious to get Niang back. So, um, you know, we have a nice blend of, of some young players that are continue to, to get better and, and we think we'll, we'll, we'll continue to improve, but certainly, you know, our focus will be to, you know, uh, to bring in some, some new talent and, you know, like the way that this draft looks, this draft looks here or, you know, from the, um, offset here, the, you know, the draft looks to be really talented on the, on the offensive line. So I think it'll be a, a combination of, uh, of what we have in house and, and blending that in with some, some new talent, potentially in free agency, potentially in the draft, but certainly like the way the draft is shaping up. And, and, you know, I, I think it's safe to say that we'll be addressing that on in any area we can. Next to Herbie T.O.B. Go to Herbie. Hey, Brett, good morning. Good morning, Herbie. Hey, two questions here for you. The first one, last year you entered the offseason with Patrick Mahomes and Chris Jones as your top priorities as far as taking care of them with extensions. How high up the list for this year would you put Tyron Matthew, who enters the final year of his contract, as far as extending him? And I'll have a, another question after that. Yeah, well, I mean, listen, you know, as you mentioned, you know, with Chris and, and, and Patrick last year, you know, you put Tyron in that category and, you know, we'll have some work to do and to get with him and, and, and his agents, but um, enough can't be said about Tyron and his importance to this, this team, both on the field and in the locker room. I mean, he's proven to be not just a great player, but a great leader and a great person to have, um, you know, developing the young guys and out in the community. So, you know, we'll certainly go to work with him and, and his agency, we can get done, but, you know, needless to say that, you know, we hope that he's a fixture uh, with the organization for, for time, you know, for years to come. And lastly, Brett, um, this is probably the, the last time we're going to talk to you before the week of the draft, and uh, you aren't likely to talk to us before then, but without the combine, the medicals, the interviews in person, how challenging is this pre-draft process compared to last year when you did have the benefit of the combine to look at medicals, et cetera? 
Yeah, it's extremely challenging. So, you know, the medical is something that I know the league has been been working on. And, and I actually had some conference calls with Rick last week and, and they're putting putting together a plan to bring in the players that would have been invited to the combine to get their medicals. Um, it won't be probably as detailed or as exact as we had in the past. That is always, um, you know, an issue. That was an issue last year when we couldn't bring guys in-house for top 30 visits or go out and, 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 and work those players out. You know, when we get guys in for top 30 visits, we have the ability to medical those guys. So any players that you didn't get at the combine, you would just invite them to the in-house facility and then do the medical here. So that'll be a huge part of it. Um, also the numbers too, I think will be interesting and we'll have to work through that. So last year we at least had the combine and we had the top hundred and so players there and we had verifieds um, in regards to height, weight, speed, 40s, Burke brought all that stuff is verified. And we had basically, you know, uh, one comprehensive sheet. Now what you'll have this year is you'll have the numbers, you know, there'll be limited access to these pro days. Now there'll be re NFL represent representation there, but you won't have full access. You'll have to be selective in where you go. And, you know, you guys know how this works. It's, it's always interesting to me when you see 40 times, you know, at the combine, you know what they are. They're running doors on turf and the environment is, is very, you know, it's, it's similar. Now, when you go to these pro days, you'll have, you know, certain players working out at an indoor facility with a faster track under weather controlled conditions. And you'll have some colleges that, you know, they'll be running in 40 degrees and the wind will be blowing in their face. Um, so when you click on the report, you'll see the numbers, but, but it's going to take a lot of kind of historical research. There are schools that typically produce faster 40 times. There are, you know, I don't want to name names, right? But I mean, there, we all know, I mean, there's a list of schools that we always say is, is you know, is that 30, did they run at 38 yards there or 39 yards there? Because you'll have a player X go to the combine and run four five and then go to their school and run four four or four three eight. So I think it'll take a lot of work of going back in some of the historical archives and 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 formulating a a metric that really stabilizes you know all the information that you're getting. So that will be challenging. At least with the combine, you knew the surface and you knew the conditions and everyone was on the level playing surface. So um, trying to differentiate between which are closer to that time and which aren't will be a challenge. I think we have a little bit of idea how to do that. Um, I think like all teams, that will be a challenge of trying to figure out, you know, are these guys really four, three guys, or would this have been a four, four, five at the combine? That'll be a little bit challenging. So um, that will be interesting, but again, all teams will have to face, face that scenario. Let's go next to Adam Teicher. Go ahead, Adam. Hey, good morning, Brad. How are you doing today? Good morning, Adam. How are you doing? Good, thanks. Hey, I wanted to follow up on uh, Sam McDowell's question. I was just curious about your philosophy about building an offensive line. I know this year was a weird one because you, you had to dig so deep into the depth on the offensive line, but still, you haven't spent a lot of money other than Mitch Schwartz extension a couple of years ago. You haven't spent a lot of money on the offensive line. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, Lucas Nyang was your highest draft pick on the offensive line last year since I, guess, I think it was Mitch Morse. So anyway, just curious about your philosophy on the offensive line and, and how you've built that and, and maybe whether that needs to change this year. And Brad, I'll have a second question as well. Yeah, yeah no, certainly that's a good question. Um, I think, you know, just the general football 101 is, is get a quarterback and then build through the offense and defensive lines. Um, at the same time, um, you know, the reality of it yeah, is, yeah. you know, how, how the draft flows and, you know, what's available to you. You have to make, you know, certainly um, good decisions and, and not overdraft or, or go in different directions. So when you talk about just, again, that one-on-one -on -one philosophy about once you secure quarterback, you want to build through the offensive lines, I certainly think you can make a case for that um, on the defensive side and continuing to throw uh, money and resources on the defensive line. Um, I would say that it, it's, it's, the similar priority for the offense line and, and, and probably those windows of opportunities of whether um, players available in free agency or whether what was available to us at the draft at that time was available. Uh, you know, last year when, when Lucas was there in the third round, certainly that was a guy that, you know, we made a priority to go get, I would say in, in years past, whether that be not having a first round pick or, or not having the lineman that you wanted available, graded as high, you know, available for when you're picking probably, you know, had something to do with that, but I don't think it's, it's certainly one of those things that you, you don't ever go into an off season or draft and, and, and not it have in your mind that one of the priorities is to continually um, invest in the offense line. And that's probably why, again, when you think about the last few drafts, uh, 
you know, the players have to be in those ranges. You don't, you know, I guess in your mind, you don't want to draft fifth round linemen in the third round and, and you want it to be, you know, um, you want it to have that value representative in regards to what round you're picking in. So I would say a lot of it had to do with just maybe where the picks fell in each round, um, what was available to us in free agency. Um, again, I think you saw that amount of effort and resources put in the defense line, but I think in general, um, your philosophy is always to, to build up front and, you know, I'm, I'm sure we'll do that this off season. Go ahead with your second, Adam. All right. Um, also, um, can you give us some idea of what the expectations are for um, Mitch Schwartz, Eric Fisher, and Pat uh, re regarding when they might be available? What, what kind of the outlook is for those three guys? Yeah, well, I'm just looking at my medical notes here. So Pat had his toe surgery on um, 2 210. Um, you know, talking to Rick earlier this or earlier or late last week, it's, it's a three month recovery. So we're hopeful you know, somewhere around that mandatory mini camp, if we have, um, you know, we certainly think by training camp, he'll be good to go and, and we'll be smart with him. Um, Mitch just recently had his, his disc worked on and we're hopeful for, um, for him to return to training camp and the same thing with fish. So um, we're hopeful both these guys will, you know, complete the rehab and, and be available for, for training camp and, and to start the, the 2021 season. Uh, I would probably say Pat's ahead of them just because of the, um, um, you know, that type of injury and probably a quicker recovery, but hopefully we'll have all three ready to go by training camp. Let's go next to Pete Sweeney. Go ahead, Pete. Hey, Brett, hope you well. Um, hey, Pete. Question about the wide receiver position. First of all, I know Sammy had said he might have interest in, in returning. I was wondering where the Chiefs' interest is in potentially retaining Watkins. And then generally speaking, your thoughts on the free agency wide receiver class and then the draft wide receiver class. Yeah, well, look, I mean, I've said it, uh, you know, many times before, you know, love Sammy and love um, what he does for our offense. Um, you know, there'll be challenges this year. It'll be a lot more challenging to, to retain him and bring him back this year just because of, of where we are. And, you know, we were able to um, to work with him and, and his agent last year and make it work. Um, you know, this year it'd probably be even more difficult just because we'll have some work to do um, to get into the cap. And, and once we do, we'll have to... Um, you know, see where the, the markets go. It is interesting, Pete, as you mentioned, it, it, it's the, it's a pretty deep class in regards to free agency and, and that receiver position. And, and typically like most years, there are numbers from top down um, in the receiver position in the draft. So, um, you know, I think we're certainly blessed to have, you know, Tyree Kill and expecting big things out of McCole Hardman this year. And I think we're all excited about the development of Myron Pringle. So we feel really good about those three players. And I think in frequency, you know, we'll be smart. And, and if something makes sense for us, um, we'll do what we do every year and listen. Um, I can't see us running out of the gates the first week in frequency to sign a receiver. I, I don't think that's where we're at. Um, but if, if the market falls and things make sense for us, I think we'll be smart and selective. And then, you know, if something doesn't work out in frequency, I think um, there's depth in that position to, to address it potentially in the draft. Let's go next to Seren Petro. Go ahead, Seren. <laughs> Brett, uh, a lot of conversation last year about how you were able to massage the cap. And I know a lot of the work for this year is is kind of done in those contracts you did last year, right? And being able to position yourself. I'm just curious, how would you describe uh, your cap situation this year? And, and uh, Brett, I'll have a follow-up, please. Well, I would say it's, you know, it's challenging, but it's, you know, it's like that for most teams. I think when you budget in years in advance, when, when you're doing things, you know, in, in real time and you're looking toward the future, you're always projecting, you know, the, you know, the progression of the cap. And so I think originally, you know, the last couple of years prior to last off season, you know, we were banking on a cap in 210. And, you know, you feel good about, all right, we're going to be in really good position. And then all of a sudden um, we go through, went through last year and, and now you're at 180. So it's, it's certainly not ideal, but I would say that there's probably half the league is in the same, same, same boat, same position. So there'll be some, I think there'll be some unusual, you know, cuts made in the next few weeks, just because teams have to um, get creative and, and, and find solutions to get into the cap. Um, you know, I think that our, our cap team, Brant Phillips, Chris, they did a great job of kind of navigating us through these rocky waters last off season and, and the contract that we did with, with Travis and Chris and Pat um, and the um, you know, roster bonus structure and our ability to convert them. You know, I think we'll, we feel like we're in a good position to, to get underneath the cap. Um, and then we'll address free agency uh, and we'll have to potentially make other moves to bring certain players in if, if we get to that point. Now, again, I don't know how it's going to work and what these markets will be 
Will we see business as usual? Probably unlikely, maybe for some players at certain positions. I do think you'll see that second wave maybe get a little, um, it may get a little interesting because I think typically, you know, in an off season, you'll have your ways of the top guys doing their deals. And then the second wave guys, maybe the next week doing their deals. I, I expect that, you know, the first week will be similar, but I think it'll be interesting with the second week and you'll see some teams not being able to do those mid-level deals or lower level deals. And I think then the market will be for different players at different positions. So, um, you know, to your question, it's, you know, it's not where we want to be, but that's the reality of, of what we went through last year in the pandemic. Um, look forward to seeing how great we can get this year, but there's always different solutions. And, you know, I'm confident in, in my staff, our ability to, um, great room and necessary to add players that will make a different deal. And then uh, to follow up, would you, is there a different philosophy, a different approach, a different mindset maybe is the, the right word right now? There's one thing when you're building a team that hasn't been to the Super Bowl in 50 years. Another thing when you've got that equity, right, in your pocket, maybe, you know, for lack of a better term, equity with your fans now back to back Super Bowls. Do, does, do you shift gears and maybe play you know, the long game last year was about right now. The last couple of years have been about right now. And now maybe there's a, a more long-term view that you take. Yeah, no, I, I certainly think that, you, you know, you feel good about, and I've said this before, you know, you have the head coach and you have the quarterback. And and now it's it's a matter of, um, you know, I, I think to your point, you, you're when you're so close and, and maybe entering that, I guess, 19 season when, you know, had one of the Super Bowl in 50 years, and then we have, a terrific season and we fell short and it, that mindset is um you know you're going all in because you know how hard it is to do it and to get there and then you get there and then you win it and then you're able to retain most of those players and get back there again um i think if you live by that mantra that sooner or later it's gonna like you said just blow up um so i think being more strategic and and just being smart in our decisions uh, like i said I, I don't think you know we're gonna go out there and and try to reinvent the wheel and we're going to be smart and, and build for the long haul. And, 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 you know, that certainly addresses the offensive defensive line. And again, it goes back to football one-on-one and, and that's what we'll do. We will invest in the offensive and defensive lines and, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll fill in the skill as we go along. So, I mean, I, I do think that, you know, once you get the things that you know that you have to have in place, um, then I think you can be more patient and let, the market and frequency come to you and let the draft come to you and, and kind of operate in that approach. We'll take three more going right down the line, starting with Matt Derrick. Go ahead, Matt. Hey, Brett, always, always appreciate the time. Um, you guys have always been able to mine, you know, the non power five conferences and, and lower division talent for, you know, whether it's in the drafts or in free agency after the draft. How are you approaching it this year when you don't have as much film on maybe some of those guys? And how are you even with the power five guys? balancing that with you know what you saw in your earlier years and going to that film yeah i mean that's that's gonna be the challenge uh this year a lot of these small school guys they really benefit from not so much the senior bowl and, and look the senior bowl does a great job of bringing those highly celebrated lower school guys and and you saw this year with the um the wisconsin whitewater center and the north North Dakota State tackle, I mean, the Northern Iowa tackle. I mean, usually the, these marquee small school players that the league knows about, they're all there. And, and that's a great um, that's a great game for them. And, and it, it helps kind of guide where these players are in regards to their draft stock. But some of these all-star games that you really missed, the, you know, the East-West game, that's where Turk Wharton popped on the screen for us last year, the NFLPA game. And some of the other games that, you know, these guys pop up off the screen and they make you go back and look at their tape. And then you're kind of anxious for their pro days to come in to see what they run and jump. That will be the challenge. So, you know, that's where you have to have depth in your scouting department. And, you know, got a lot of experienced guys out there, guys that have been doing this for 15, 20 years. And whether that be Pat Perduto or, you know, Willie Davis, uh, um, Terry Delt, Trey Cozy on the West Coast. I mean, these guys, that's that's what they do, and that's why they're great at what they do. They, they spend a lot of time on the road, and, um, you know, they're usually ahead of the game before these guys even get to all-star games. So it's it's just going to require um, just more work and and just more um, deliberation with our area scouts and, and, and reviewing these guys, and it'll be tough. We can't, again, we can't bring these guys out here to medical, and I do think you're going to see – my guess would be that, you know, and every year you have a, a ton of undrafted free agents make the team. But I, I suspect this will be a season where you'll see not only undrafted free agents make teams, but have 
actually have some big impacts right away, just because a lot of these guys, because of the lack of, of additional exposure that they would have had in the past, um, they won't have that this year. So, you know, I think it'll be, um, you know, it'll be our, you know, our goal and our objective to make sure that, you know, we're one of those teams that identifies and lands one of those guys like we did last year in Turk Wharton. Go next to Sam Mellinger. Good, Sam. Hey, Brett. Uh, good to see you. Um, but before I ask the question I was going to ask, um, can I just have you clarify something? With Eric Fisher, you said that you were expecting him back by training camp. Are you saying that there's a chance he could play, you know, first game of the regular season? Yeah, I think, um, look at my notes right here. Achilles surgery, 129. You know, I, based on Rick and his medical staff, he he's projects a mid-August return. So now listen, how that works, you know, everything is different and everyone recovers differently. So, you know, I think um, with that injury and, and, you know, with the time leading up for the season, you know, Rick has here a mid-August return and you know how that works. That's all always, you know, to be determined until the player actually reports back to camp and goes through the off season and see where he is. But I think that, um, you know, the mid-August timeline was put in front of my notes here. So, you know, I'll, I'll defer to Rick on that and, and trust his medical expertise. I hear you. Okay. Um, and uh, the other thing you mentioned, offensive line is being a good uh, position in the draft. And I think it sounded like you were saying first day, first round there. Uh, what are some positions you see some depth and, and maybe some value day two, day three? I think, you know, we just finished our, our what would have been our pre-combine meetings uh, this past weekend um, and getting through the board, you know, every year you're going to have numbers at receivers just because every team seems to have two or three of those guys. So there's certainly some, some depth of the wide receiver position. I, I would say the two positions though that really jump out at you would be the offensive line, and the cornerback position. Uh, I, I think those are the two positions that kind of just, when you look at the board, they kind of just scream at you that there's depth there, you know, really rounds one through, through three, one through four. Now they'll go quick. So even though there's numbers there, by the time you blink your eyes and you get into the middle or late round two, all of those numbers that you saw, we joke about it every year. Like, wow, there's so many linemen. But when you pick 31, 32 every year, by the time you get to 231, they're all gone. I mean, that's just the way it works. But just from a sheer number standpoint, I think the offensive line is really deep. I think the cornerback position is deep. And I think the receiver position, um, you know, has some, some value in the middle and late rounds. Quarterback looks to be a pretty good class, but I, don't, I can't anticipate in drafting drafting a quarterback. So certainly early anyway. But um, um, but yeah, I, I you know to your question, O line, corner, and receivers, I, I think look pretty good. Everywhere else is a little bit thinner. You know, some positions maybe more thin than in years past. So there'll be a little bit more work to do to see if you can build up the numbers and and identify talent later on in the draft. We'll go last to Nate Taylor. Go ahead, Nate. Hey, Brad. Good to see you as always. I have. Hey, I have two questions for you. The first to start is um, from a defensive philosophy, how do you anticipate this off season in terms of trying to build out on the defense? You mentioned defensive line earlier, but just do you feel like there's room to do it both in free agency and through the draft in terms of getting the defense slightly better? Yeah, I don't, you know, free agency again will be um, a unique animal for us. So we'll, on one end, we'll work our conversions to get into the cap. And then what we have left and, and what we can do will be largely dependent on what becomes available to us. And do we think this would be, a, you know, the right course of action? And are there other moves that we would have to make to make this work? So that'll be one thing. And then on the draft, um, you know, I, I think, um, you know, that will be the, you know, it, it kind of works hand in hand. So based upon how the free agency works out. And if you're able to address it, then, you know, the draft will work hand in hand. So if you're able to potentially, you know, address one area, then it, it gives you more flexibility to add in, in another area. Now, if you can't do anything in the draft and or in free agency, then, you know, you'll certainly have a lot of holes to fill in the draft. But, um, but just, again, from a thousand foot view, when you look at our roster composition, I think, you know, we certainly want to build back our offensive line. And then on the defensive side, like our secondary. And, and you know, um, if I think depth at the linebacker position and defensive line will be something that we'll try to address either through free agency or, or and or the draft. So, um, you, you know, if you're, if you're asking me just now, again, this can go in many different directions, but just in general, you know, looking forward in the blueprint for the offseason, I mean, we're certainly going to look on the offensive line, the defensive line and the linebacker position to get better. And, um, but that's not to say you can't get better at every position, you know, getting Travis a backup tight end, getting depth at wide out, identifying more young corners that we've been able to do um, and certainly look to continue to do in the draft will be something that will be always on our radar. And you may find value that you didn't expect. I mean, you may find, you know, you, you may be thinking one thing and then all of a sudden another position that 
you didn't anticipate having access to becomes available and you just have to have um, different game plans in place. Yeah, and then secondly, Brad, I'm sure you saw these comments, but DeMar Smith uh, about a week ago uh, gave the impression to agents that because of a you know truncated cap that maybe you know more than in previous years agents should you know in essence collude to not uh, obviously get the best deals for their players. I'm just wondering from a team that already has its constraints with the salary cap and where it may go uh, between now and the start of free agency, how do you navigate that when understanding that you know guys want to get the best deals for their players in terms of agents? but also you have to somehow structure it to work within uh, the confines of the league in terms of maybe ages colluding more than usual. Yeah. And I mean, listen, that's difficult. And I think that, you know, the only thing that we can do or have the power to do is, is, you know, offer our position or contract and, and, you know, explain it and, and work with the agents in regards to what, what's possible. And there comes a point where certain things because of uh, the stress of the limited cap, puts on the agent, the player, the organization. Um, I think what we do is we exhaust every scenario and every possible way things can get executed. And if it if it happens to, to jive with the player and their agent, if it makes sense to them, then, you know, then it works. But um, there are limitations on what you can do. But I think our job is to just get creative as possible for players that we really want and, you know, work with them and, and, and try to find a middle ground. And, and you know, there's there's – there's no easy answer to that question because it, it is every agent is different. Every player is different. Every scenario is different. I like to think though, that once you can find a happy medium and find a middle ground that Kansas city and, and, and playing in front of this, this great fan base and playing with Pat Mahomes and playing for Andy Reid is certainly appealing. So I feel like half the battle is already won with what we have to offer in regards to playing here and um, having opportunity to, play for Super Bowls and compete for titles. So the other part, you know, I'll defer and rely on, on Brent and Chris and getting creative and working for solutions to get these guys paid, maybe in unconventional ways, but they've done a great job of figuring out how to get that done.